Uh, okay, today we're going to talk about uh, non-inferiority trials. Uh, I want to first uh, clarify that uh, most of this set of slides were prepared by uh, uh, Professor Scott Evans. Uh, Scott and I co-authored the book, uh, Fundamental Concepts for uh, New Clinical Trialists. Uh, when I met him uh, back in 2003, uh, he was at Harvard. Uh, and of course, recently he moved to uh, George Washington University and he's uh, uh, <clears throat> responsible for the uh, biostatistics group uh, over in George Washington University. So in his slides, while he was at Harvard, he used a lot of examples from the uh, uh, ACE trials and uh, some other trials. Um, so when explaining the slides, some of the things uh, I may not be as uh, articulate as Scott. So I just wanted to clarify it up front. So here's uh, uh, the way he sort of presented the stuff. He started with uh, background and then non-inferiority trials, uh, examples, assumptions. We will talk about constancy and I say sensitivity. These are the assumptions for uh, doing non-clinical, uh, doing non-inferiority clinical trials. <laughs> and of course, uh, design issues, choice of, uh, choice of control, choice of margin, uh, bio creep, sample size. So. We will cover uh, most of the, uh, these topics today. So in Scott's uh, notation, he called it non-inferiority, NI, uh, CI being confidence interval. And these are the few notations uh, he uses. Uh, so we'll just respect uh, Scott's notation. Uh, M and uh, T is intervention. So T is very common. We use test drug, all right? Uh, C being active control. Sometimes I use A instead of C, and P being placebo. Uh, so the thought was a single arm study, administer an inter, uh, intervention to a group of uh, patients and see if they improve uh, or they're cured. So, um, of course, there's a lot of limitations, right? Uh, uh, cannot control for natural history. Uh, people may have improved anyway. And there's a placebo effect. Uh, Patients, clinicians believe that uh, they are getting better because of the treatment, uh, but is manifesting itself uh, in better outcomes. Uh, so these are the subjectivity associated with uh, drug treatment. Or you could miss a good result when you observe no change, but patients would have uh, gotten worse um, if less left untreated. So we need control group. Control for natural history, control for placebo effect. Uh, so then if you move to a placebo control trial, you randomize uh, patients to one of two arms, a new intervention, we call it key, test drug, or placebo, P, all right? Uh, blind intervention uh, to patients and investigators when possible, and uh, analysis compares the two arms with respect to the response. So if you look at uh, uh, this graph here, um, the uh, uh, P1 being the efficacy of the new treatment, P2 being the efficacy of the control group. So uh, test drug uh, control. And uh, <clears throat> if you do a superiority trial uh, and you're looking for a, a superiority to the right hand side, so in other words, if positive being good, then this is statistically significant superior, and this is statistically uh, inferior. And uh, all of these, uh, I think this one you're gonna accept the null hypothesis. And these two are statistically inferior, and this is uh, kind of accepting the null hypothesis. So now we look at placebo control trial, there are limitations also. Uh, if an uh, effective uh, standard of care, uh, treatment exists, uh, then the transition to placebo may not be ethical. Uh, well, so I want to uh, clarify about my point. I mean, uh, so this was, like I said, mostly uh, Scott's slides, but my point is that whenever I can use placebo control, I will try my best because this ethical or not ethical uh, is more like a medical call, it's less, li uh, less likely being a statistical call. So from a statistical point of view, I think placebo control will be the gold standard. Whenever I can use placebo control, I will do that. <laughs> so consider using a standard of care as active control. 
and show non-inferiority to the actual control, uh, thus significant efficacy over placebo. Well, there are certain disease areas, so there are certain uh, uh, treatment uh, situations that we have to use uh, active control. Uh, and I will use that example uh, um, in many places when we talk about uh, non-impurity trials. I think the most, uh, 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 most well-known setting is antibiotics. Uh, for bacteria infection, I think we, we know that, uh, uh, of course, the first uh, antibiotic was penicillin. It was kind of uh, in the 1930s, 1940s kind of things. And so as, as those years, we don't have clinical trial. So uh, the, uh, the efficacy was kind of uh, established without the uh, clinical, clinical trial evidence. But uh, today, if you're doing uh, antibiotic trials, um, it is not ethical to have placebo control now because uh, there's so many good antibiotics uh, out there. So for a patient up here in the hospital and uh, the patient will need antibiotics and we cannot ethically uh, randomize placebo to these patients. Um, but in most other therapeutic areas, I think it could be uh, debatable. Um, oncology will be a, a, a special situation. So uh, uh, oncology nowadays, there are so many therapies out there. So, um, but the oncology placebo control is mainly about above and beyond the standard of care, you add test drug or you add placebo. So these are uh, the oncology settings. So absence of evidence is not evidence of absence. This is uh, a very important understanding. In other words, when we test null hypothesis, uh, the typical way of statistical hypothesis is that the null being test and control are non-differentiable. So we have these two distributions, one test drug distribution, one control distribution. If you cannot dis uh, distinguish them, you say, well, um, we cannot tell any difference. So in placebo control trial, this is very clear. Now, if the two distributions separate, so you have two different distributions and then you can claim, well, there's a statistical significant difference between these two, di uh, two distributions. Now, if I'm doing an active control trial, and I try to claim that my test drug is no different from the active control simply because I cannot dis differentiate the distribution. And I say non-inferiority. I mean, that is not valid. So that's the statement about ab absence of evidence is not evidence of absence. That means if you do an active control trial, you say the null hypothesis being uh, mu t equal to mu c, right? Test drug and active control is no different. And then you, fail to reject and claim, well, from that point of view, we say the test drug is not inferior to uh, uh, active control. That's not a correct statement because uh, you just don't have evidence to show that you're not inferior. You're not inferior. You cannot claim on that basis to say there's evidence to show the test drug is not inferior to placebo. So, the way Scott put it, the hypothesis testing is analogous to a cold trial. Uh, people are assumed innocent until proven guilty. So the non hypothesis being innocent. So you have to collect enough evidence to, to show guilty. In other words, if you don't have enough evidence to show guilty, it doesn't mean the uh, uh, suspect is innocent. So if verdict equals not guilty, so you do not reject the law then we cannot say that we have proven innocence. We say that we fail to find enough evidence to prove guilt. And of course, there's a subtle difference and it's very important between the two. So absence of evidence is not evidence of absence. So that's the difficulty from a statistical point of view. When we perform statistical hypothesis testing, the null is no difference in the alternative is there's a difference. Thus, we cannot conclude the equivalence simply because fail to reject not. We cannot do that. Uh, historical problems with uh, reporting. So there's some um, uh, literatures um, 
publications, 67% of the in, in, inappropriately concluded non inferior uh, based on non significant uh, superiority tests. You cannot make that statement. Right? Only 23 pre specify a non inferior margin. So let me uh, uh, talk about the margin later. We will talk about more about the margin. In fact, for clinical development of new drugs, the only two situations where we're looking for a two-sided test are bioequivalence and bio, uh, biosimilarity. Other than those two situations, the clinical trials are by nature one-sided. They're not two-sided tests. In other words, if I'm comparing the placebo, I want to show the test drug is better than, than placebo. So it's a one-sided test. Same thing with non-inferiority. So non-inferiority is a one-sided test. So instead of saying that the test drug is no different from active control, you're saying the test drug is non-inferior to active control. So from that perspective, you're looking only at one-sided. So in other words, if the test drug is super, uh, is inferior to the active control, then you're not going to approve it. Now, <clears throat> if it's one-sided, the thinking is that instead of comparing against a zero, because when you look at mu t equal to mu p, you're essentially saying mu t minus mu p equals to zero versus a one-sided alternative hypothesis being mu t minus mu p greater than zero, all right? So this is, this is really using a zero to show the test drug is better than placebo. And from non-inferiority point of view, because it's one-sided, technically what we can do is that we can just come up with a margin to say mu t minus mu c minus margin greater than zero. Or mu t minus mu c, the null hypothesis being mu t minus mu c equals margin. And the alternative being mu t minus mu c is greater than the margin. Once you set up this margin, this non-inferiority margin, now the statistical positive test is very similar to placebo control trials. Because in placebo control, placebo control trials, mu t minus mu p equal to zero versus greater than zero. And now all you're going to say is that mu t minus mu p is equal to m versus the alternative hypothesis being greater than m, which is a margin. So that's technically how we handle this non-inferiority trials because the nature of the hypothesis test is a one-sided test. So this part is different from the way Scott is presenting. All right, when Scott was presenting about this absence of uh, evidence, it's not evidence of ab uh, evidence, that's more, more likely from a two-sided point of view, but from one-sided hypothesis, we can still perform this hypothesis test, but with the only difficulty is adding a margin. So now I'm here to try, randomized to one of two arms, new intervention versus active control, mu T versus mu C, okay. Blind intervention to uh, to patients and the investigators when possible, and of course the way we blind it is we do a double down double blind. Uh, so we have a placebo for test drug, we have a placebo for uh, active control, and then you uh, perform double down double blind. Analysis compares the two arms uh, with respect to response. Uh, need to show new intervention is no worse than active control. <laughs> so decide on a non inferiority margin. So later we're going to talk about margin. And for data analysis, get a confidence interval for the difference between the two arms. New intervention minus active control with respect to efficacy. And note if the lower bound of the confidence interval uh, is within the non-inferior margin. So remember, it's one-sided. It's one-sided test. It's one-sided confidence interval. 
All right. Uh, I would hope to maintain some uh, consistency in all the presentations in certain slides. In other words, if I'm assuming positive value is better, so I'm always looking for a positive value. But unfortunately, in this set of slides, the examples, some of the examples, um, uh, positive values means better. Some examples, negative values means better. Uh, so if we're looking at positive me meaning better, then you're always looking for lower confidence interval of test rock minus active control. If the lower confidence limit is above the margin, that actually says from a hypothesis testing point of view, you are superior to active control uh, minus margin. All right. So that's basically what we're trying to do. All right. Because if positive is better, so you want to have the test drug to be better than the active control subtract margin, having a more positive value. Now, if negative means better, that means your upper confidence limit has to be below the active control plus the positive margin. Uh, two examples. One example being pain reduction. Pain reduction means lower pain is better. So you're looking at mu t minus mu c to be a negative value. All right. Now, so if you're looking at mu t mi minus mu c to be a negative value, then you're looking for the upper confidence limit to be below mu c plus m, where m is a positive value. Now, if you're looking for positive value being better, that means if we look at the, uh, the uh, respiratory drug, we're looking at volume, uh, lung volume, FVC uh, or uh, uh, FEV1, forced expiration volume at one second. So if the lung function improved, you can uh, uh, breathe better. So the, you want the uh, uh, FEV1 to be a positive value. Then if you're comparing against a, an active control, you're looking at mu t minus mu c to be positive. So then the lower confidence has to be greater than the mu c plus a negative margin. So this graph is a little busy here. So again, we're looking at P1, P2. And now if you're looking at the margin being negative value, that means you want the test drug to be better on the positive side. Right. So here, if you're looking at zero, that is when your test drug minus placebo, uh, test of minus active control is the same. And the margin being a negative value, you want it to be better this way. Okay. So P1 being efficacy of new treatment, P2 being efficacy of the control group. Superiority means, uh, P1 minus P2 equals zero, and alternative being greater than zero. So here should be a one-sided, all right? Now for non-inferiority is that you want the null being, again, one-sided below this point, that will be uh, inferior, but above this point being non-inferior. So let's look at A, all right? A, the point estimate is below zero, all right? Now B, the point estimate is even below margin and C is way out. But D is not inferior because D, not only the point estimate is right on, but the lower confidence limit is above the negative margin. E is interesting. E is um, uh, statistically significantly inferior to active control, but the lower limit is above margin, all right? But remember, for non-inferior trial, it's one-sided, so we don't, we don't care about the side, all right? This part doesn't matter, because as long as your lower limit meets a margin, you can claim non-inferior, okay? Regardless of the upper limit, it's a one-sided test. And of course, F, you reach superiority. So here are some of the examples. AZT, 
was the first ACE drug. Um, it was approved, uh, I think, back in the late 80s. All right. And uh, ACT was uh, Boris Wellcome. Uh, right now, it's part of GSK. Um, now, uh, <clears throat> DDI was a uh, Bristol Myers Squibb drug. Uh, I think right now they recently merged with Celgen. Uh, in the treatment of HIV infection, uh, HIV uh, uh, the evolve uh, the the involvement of uh, HIV study is kind of over the decades. Uh, it was first. Uh, identified as a um, well, HIV being human immunodeficiency, uh, immunodeficiency virus. We identified that virus back in early 80s and um, it was uh, life-threatening and uh, because uh, HIV sort of uh, destructed our immune system, uh, so patients got infection and uh, they died. Uh, so when ACT was developed, I think the endpoint was survival. Uh, because there's so many deaths. But after AZT is available, uh, getting to early 90s, uh, late 80s, early 90s, then if you want to study AIDS or HIV, uh, then you start looking at uh, markers because many patients survived. And uh, so uh, in those years, we're looking at CD4 counts, and nowadays we're looking at the uh, viral load and these kind of markers, all right? So DDI was a um, uh, Bristol Myers Squibb drug, um, 500 milligrams, 750. The objective is to show DDI is non inferior to AZT. Now, AZT is less friendly. If uh, AZT is available on the market, it's, it is no longer ethical to run a placebo controlled trial for HIV. Rationale in 1989, uh, AZT was the only approved uh, anti uh, anti real. ARV the uh, uh, drug and it had been shown uh, better than placebo in reducing disease progression and more treatments needed in case of resistance development. So it's very similar to our situation today with COVID. Now uh, with COVID, uh, there are going to be uh, uh, variants and there are going to be uh, uh, resistance to uh, to drugs and things like that. So uh, there, there's a there's a public health need of developing new uh, agents for uh, both in terms of vaccination and uh, treatment. So DDI versus placebo is not uh, no longer ethical with availability of uh, ACT. So the endpoint was timed to uh, ACE defining event or, or deaths. So for the DDI uh, development in those years, uh, they're looking at this as a primary endpoint. Uh, but for AZT, uh, I think it was uh, uh, survival was uh, was the primary endpoint. So they're looking for non inferiority margin to say to look at the hazard ratio. All right. So hazard ratio being the hazard of uh, uh, DDI over the hazard of uh, AZT, and you're looking at the upper bound of the confidence interval or the upper uh, confidence limit should be less than 1.6. You look at the DDI 500 milligram got a um, hazard ratio of 1.02 with 90% confidence interval of uh, 0.79 to 1.33. So this is less than 1.6. And the 750 milligram uh, upper limit 1.34. So both are less than 1.6. So both of those are approved. All right, so this was the uh, the AZT, uh, I mean, the TDI versus AZT uh, hazard ratio. So hazard ratio, we know uh, if it's uh, DDI hazard over AZT hazard, you want lower batter, the lower the batter. Uh, but because it's random, so that ratio could be greater than one, could be less than one. So even though the true DDI is better than uh, AZT, where the hazard ratio should be actually below one, but because randomness, because of uh, sampling error or whatever, it looks like greater than one. But as long as your upper confidence limit is below 1.6, it's approvable. 
a randomized double blind multi center study comparing the efficacy of the safety of. So, this is a different example here. All right. In this example, they have PT and IC. All right. MS journey, uh, IV six hours to treat uh, pneumonia in hospitalized patients. All right. So, PT uh, versus IC, these two drugs for comparison. All right. So, IC is considered as the active control. And PT is considered as the uh, a new drug. So this is your test drug, this is your control, all right? Now the FT control, they have 60 out of uh, 99 cured. And the test drug, you have 67 out of 98 cured. And with a nine freedom margin of 20%. But if you look, simply look at the point estimate, the point estimate, the new drug is better than uh, the FT control, all right? But still, now we're looking at a non-inferior margin of 0.2, right? 20%. In other words, in the ACT and DDI study, hazard ratio being lower is better, all right? Lower is better, so you're looking at upper limit. Now, this one, you're looking at percent cured, so higher is better, more positive number is better. So this would be a, a sort of greater than 80%, right? So not every margin of 20%. So in other words, uh, no, I, I shouldn't say 80%. In other words, you're looking at the difference. The difference has to be greater than a minus 0.2 comparison, all right? So let's look. The lower bound of 95% confidence role on the, uh, uh, for the difference uh, in response rate is minus 0.066. So the lower limit, the lower limit is greater than, uh, well, it, it, it's greater than minus 0.2, all right? So, so apparently this uh, PT is not inferior to, uh, uh, to IC. All right. So of course you can de debate whether twenty percent was too large or not. All right. Again, this is a one-sided test. In other words, you're looking at one-sided of uh, mu t minus mu c uh, to be greater than a negative value of m. The negative value of m being minus point two, right? A, a, a negative um, a m being a negative value. I'm sorry. But now inferiority will be shown for a margin as small as 7%. So PT was not inferior approved by FDA. Now in trial, compares a new intervention T against an active control C that has been shown to be effective in the treatment um, of the target condition. All right, so in other words, we have to trust that C is superior to placebo. All right, from a regulatory point of view, whether you can approve the drug or not. You really want to see if the new drug is superior to placebo. That's what we're really concerned. But because of ethical reasons, because other reasons, we cannot use uh, placebo control. So in your final trial, there's no placebo group in the study. And how can you demonstrate the test drug is superior to placebo? So you want to do it in an indirect way to say if it's not inferior, to the active control, and because the active control was able to demonstrate superiority to placebo, then we can claim this test drug is superior to placebo. So the, the entire drug approval objective is to demonstrate the test drug is superior to placebo. But because placebo is not included in the uh, phase three trial, and then you have to come up with this uh, non-inferiority trial. So the comparison is based on the estimate um, of a parameter beta, all right? So you're, you're comparing the test drug against active control, but you're really looking at the comparison between the test drug and placebo. Because we agree that active control has been shown to be superior to placebo, we need not to show that a uh, uh, test drug is superior to active control. Actually, to show a test drug is superior to active control can be very, very difficult, all right? Uh, let's go back to this uh, antibiotic example, all right? So we know penicillin works. 
but we don't really have placebo controlled penicillin data. Now, most about uh, antibiotic, antibiotics nowadays are working in terms of the cure rate being 80%, 90%, 85% uh, or something like that. Now, if you're looking at, uh, suppose there's a true placebo uh, clinical trial, and you say placebo does help with uh, antibacterial activity to a, a smaller percent of patients. Well, suppose it's 30%. 30% patients could benefit from placebo. If you're looking at penicillin, if we're saying if 80%, all right. Now 80% minus 30% is 50% superior. So we know the antibiotic is already, the approved antibiotic or standard of care is already 50% better than placebo. And it's, reach the 80%, 85%, or even 90%. And now you come up with a new antibiotic, you want to demonstrate it is superior to the FE control by 50%. And you're talking about 130%, that's not possible. So there's no way we can show test drug is superior to FE control. So the best way we can do is we, we may be able to show the test drug is non-inferior to the FD control. So that's why we have this dilemma that how can we demonstrate the test drug is non-inferior to FD control. So it is impossible to show the two treatments have identical efficacy. As a matter of fact, two distributions are never the same. Once you increase the sample size, you can always differentiate the two. Instead, uh, instead, instead we choose a, a margin M and seek to prove that the treatment benefit is either less than M or greater than M, depending on the direction that we want to, uh, the direction of the efficacy, whether it's more positive being better or more negative is better. So if it's more positive better, then we're looking at the lower confidence limit has to be greater than to a negative value. If we're lo looking for lower is better, more negative is better, then we're looking for the upper confidence limit to be below a positive margin, okay? So this is another point where I disagree, uh, I disagree with uh, Scott. Scott says the traditional rule of hypothesis tests are reversed. Um, no, that's not the case because for one-sided tests, the only difference is instead of comparing against zero, we're not comparing against M, which is a margin. We try to rule out important relevant differences with reasonable confidence, all right? So without margin, we're looking at placebo control trial. We're trying to rule out uh, unimportant um, differences. So <clears throat> test drug is often better than active control in many other ways. It could be a better uh, safety profile, less expensive, uh, more convenient to, uh, convenient to administer, uh, less invasive, fewer pills, uh, easier to comply, shorter treatment duration. Uh, let me give you uh, a personal experience about uh, the uh, non-inferior trials uh, uh, in the past about decade or so, all right? So we know the first uh, new generation of uh, anticoagulant uh, was Pradexa, uh, which was, based on the non-inferior trial against warfarin. So be, before Pradexa, it was warfarin. Uh, so after Pradexa, of course, there's many other new generation um, uh, anticoagulants. Uh, so after Pradexa, it was Zorato. Uh, and after Zorato, it was uh, Aliquas. So these are the newer generation of anticoagulants. Now, but before this newer generation, the only thing we have uh, was uh, warfarin. So, uh, uh, if patients with uh, atrial fibrillation, uh, they're more likely to develop a stroke because uh, there could be a blood clot. And if the blood clot goes to your brain, uh, then that would uh, cause stroke. Uh, if, if it blocks your uh, bloodstream, blood supply to part of your brain tissues, then that part of the brain tissues, because of lack of oxygen, uh, uh, they may dysfunction. Uh, 
So traditionally, we have warfarin. Warfarin trying to sort of anticoagulant, trying to um, uh, dissolve the uh, blood clot in your bloodstream. But the problem with warfarin is um, that each subject's um, um, metabolism of warfarin can be different. And also for the same patient at different times could be different. So for warfarin patient, uh, for, for patients on warfarin, uh, they have to regularly go to the clinic and do the uh, uh, blood test to see the amount of drug in their blood. Because if the amount of drug in the blood is too high, they have to uh, uh, so reduce uh, the warfarin uh, intake. If it is too low, they have to increase. Because if it's too high, it will cause bleeding. So bleeding is another problem. But if it's too low, uh, it does not uh, have the uh, uh, anticoagulant uh, property that you want to have. So, so for warfarin patients, it's very inconvenient. Uh, so if they have to take time, take the time off uh, from work, they have to get the transportation, go to the clinic and do the blood drawing and uh, look at the results and adjust the dosage kind of things. But with the newer generation of anticoagulant, there's no problem. I mean, so uh, it's the same, uh, the same metabolism system that uh, uh, they're, they're fixed doses. Uh, so for the prescription uh, of the newer generation anticoagulant, the, the main thing you want to look for is their renal function. If there are no more renal function, uh, uh, you can go with the high doses. If their renal function has some issues, you can go with the lower doses and fixed dose. It's very convenient. So there's still a lot of reasons to develop newer generation drugs uh, uh, to treat the same condition. Uh, another example would be antibiotics. So in antibiotics, uh, uh, many of the bacteria would develop uh, resistance. So there's still a demand of newer generation antibiotics. Examples in HIV, we seek less complicated or less toxic regimens with similar efficacy uh, to existing regimens. Uh, well, restriction of generic is a different issue. It's, uh, it's bioequivalence, so that's, uh, that doesn't fit here. And uh, sometimes we want to show uh, twice a day is not inferior to three times a day on the same drug, all right? And to show that uh, capsule is not inferior to tablet, um, identify new treatment options in case uh, resistance is developed. Uh, these, this situation is bioequivalent. This situation is bioequivalent, okay? Now, so we're talking about assumptions. So in order to perform non-inferior trial, we have to make some assumptions. One assumption being constancy. What do I mean by constancy? Constancy being the standard of care may have been established for several years based on their uh, placebo controlled uh, phase three clinical trials, maybe five years or 10 years away uh, 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 before. Well, for example, in the uh, Wolfram case, Warfarin was uh, approved back in the 70s. And uh, the uh, Prodexa trial and the uh, Zorado trial and the Adequos trial was uh, about uh, 2007, 2008, 2009 uh, in, in those years. So it's about at least 30 years away. So when you run an active control trial, you want to you want to assume that the active control itself still maintains the efficacy as the previous trials they were able to demonstrate uh, the superiority to placebo. So the active control has to be superior to placebo or the standard of care should be superior to placebo. Now trials 20, 30 years ago were able to demonstrate the drug efficacy can we still believe the efficacy of this uh, active control is the same as 20 or 30 years ago? So we have to make this constancy assumption, right? So historical data, active control showed superiority to placebo in trial one, all right? Now, uh, if there's a new 
at the control, let's see. When he says C2 is, uh, could be a, or this could be, um, all right, if placebo was present in, in the non inferior trial, um, and then you were able to show that, um, <clears throat> later we're going to talk about bio creep. So before talk about bio creep, we're looking at constancy. So what do I mean by bio creep? Bio creep is that, if active control C1 is superior to placebo, active control C2 is non-inferior to C1, and active control C3 is non-inferior to C2, eventually the difference could be shrinking, and then, uh, so that means it's creeping to the placebo, all right? So, but anyhow, we're, we're making this assumption being constant, all right? Uh, may not be the case uh, in the presence of resistance, um, uh, resistance development, or with a uh, different trial conduct, administration of treatment, uh, difference in population endpoints, and stuff like that. So it's a non, not verifiable in uh, current trial without placebo. So that's, that's a problem, right? Because we want to show the new intervention is superior to placebo, but we don't have a placebo in there. So we're using a standard of care or active control to sort of uh, as another control to indirectly prove that the new intervention is superior to placebo. Another thing, of course, being SS sensitivity. SS sensitivity means trial has to be able to detect differences between two treatments if they if they exist. So in other words, if the trial is designed in a way that if there's a true difference, you cannot demonstrate it, then you lost assay sensitivity. Well, one simple example being, if your sample size is not large enough, if the sample size is not large enough, then your test rate is truly inferior to actually control. But because the sample size is too small, then you cannot differentiate and you say, ah, there's not inferior. So the idea of introducing a margin is that, you know, you have to maintain a large enough sample size to maintain the assay sensitivity. Design issues, of course, of participants, endpoints, and other important aspects of trial should be similar to those used in the trials used to demonstrate the effectiveness of active control over placebo, right? So you want, your protocol design will be as similar as possible to the edge control designs, right? Early HIV studies used deaths as primary endpoint. When deaths became uncommon, then ACE clinical trials, uh, uh, ACE uh, clinical events were used. So today we're using surrogate markers. Uh, we're uh, looking at viral load of C will counts. So the endpoint is different. Right? And of course, you include the exclusion criteria of the patient participating in the study, you want to be, uh, to be as similar as possible also. Choice of active control um, um, must have clinical efficacy. Um, so active control should have clinical efficacy of, sub, of substantial magnitude that is precisely estimated uh, with estimates that are relevant uh, to the setting in which the non inferior trial is being conducted. So you want to maintain as much as constant as possible in your new design, preferably me measured by the same control, uh, uh, measured by multiple uh, control trials. Regular approve, uh, approval does not necessarily imply that an intervention can be used as an anti control uh, in a non-inferiority study. All right. Superiority to placebo must be real, uh, reliably established. Uh, must have proven superiority to placebo. Uh, uh, estimate effect size over placebo is used to determine the um, non inferior margin. Otherwise, uh, one may be designing a trial to show non inferiority is something that is no better than no better than placebo. Right. So the choice of control is important. 
Recently, there has uh, there have been concerns over the development of non-inferior studies using IP control that do not have proven efficacy over placebo. Um, I mean, there are people claim that placebos are unethical because uh, these active controls um, are standard of care practice. And so there are times that patients are unwilling to enroll IRBs question the uh, ethics of placebos. So these are the practical difficulties. I mean, again, from a statistical point of view, I would always, always want to use a placebo control. But the pra practicality does not allow me to use placebo control, so I was forced to use active control. Uh, some examples here. Um, so fluconazole uh, was a sort of antifungal drug, all right, uh, not available in Africa. And uh, nystatin was used in many places uh, as standard of care for antifungal, I think this is antifungal, all right. Oral candidiasis is, uh, is kind of fungal infection, all right. Or GV uh, showed excellent uh, in vitro activity, um, but inexpensive, all right. So Fukanza was too expensive. A non-inferior trials of GV compared to nystatin was proposed. And however, this, despite the standard use of nystatin, there were no published studies that could identify the evidence uh, that nystatin was superior to placebo. So pushing for three, three group design. Well, if I have a placebo control, I will always use placebo control. So similar issues uh, have uh, arisen was treatments that were uh, once shown to be effective, but may no longer be effective because of development resistance. MRSA. All right, MRSA being Mississippi resistance, uh, Staph aureus is a uh, very severe infection. Uh, MRSA has been a very severe problem, I think uh, about 10, 15 years ago, uh, but now uh, um, uh, we have better control, all right? Uh, again, we need anti newer generative antibiotics. Then I said, uh, Mesocillin uh, resistant uh, Staphylococcus uh, uh, aureus. Uh, this is kind of bacteria infection, bacterial infection that has become resistant to many uh, antibiotics. Uh, lives on the skin, uh, can be acquired, uh, spreads through contact. Uh, so ID being infectious disease clinicians, all right? All right, infectious disease clinicians is uh, antibiotic, uh, Antimicrobials um, are highly effective in treating skin infection, but seem unable to cite evidence to back the claim other than anecdotal evidence. So without the data to support one of the, the drugs as control, uh, based upon reliable and reproducible evidence um, of the magnitude of the benefit of uh, control compared to placebo, the results of um, um, non-inferior trials are not meaningful. All right, uh, so margin, choice of margin. Uh, choice of margin is sub subjective, all right? So choice of margin is very much similar to uh, when you design a placebo control trial, the choice of delta. It's rather subjective, but we hope the choice of margin being structured, all right? Combination of statistical reasoning and clinical judgment. The cost of being maximum treatment difference that is clearly irrelevant. So in other words, the margin has to be uh, sort of uh, not clearly meaningful difference. Margin should be smaller than delta, all right? When you do a placebo control trial, you want the test drug is superior to placebo by delta amount. So that delta amount will show a clearly meaningful difference. Margin has to be smaller than delta. Well, if margin is the same as delta, then you're showing your test drug. Uh, if your test drug is another placebo, then the difference is about delta. The difference between your test drug and the active control is about delta. So margin has to be smaller than delta. You want to exclude a clearly relevant difference, right? So maximum difference that is clearly irrelevant. Largest treatment difference that is acceptable in order to gain advantage of the experimental uh, intervention. Design parameter is not present in superior trials. Uh, 
So placebo control is zero, not a problem, right? So how do we choose margin? Or it must be smaller than effect size um, of C over P. Active control over placebo, that's the delta. So your margin has to be smaller than that, right? Use historical data and account for within trial and the cross trial uh, variability. Theoretically, should be chosen independent of the consideration of study power. So it should have nothing to do with the sample size. It directly impacts study conclusions. Whether you can prove the drug or not approve the drug is based on this margin and is context dependent. Uh, investors frequently uh, said M equal to half of the estimated e effect of FD control relative placebo from historical evidence. Uh, this is known as the uh, preserving a fraction of effect. So if you're looking at half of the distance between active control and placebo, then you're looking at um, a 50% um, preserve, uh, preserving 50% of effect. Of course, you can preserve 60%, 70%. So that's a different choice of margin. So if you look at this example, I think given the time, I will probably finish this example and we'll stop here uh, because I did mention about bio creep. Um, so we don't have to spend much time on bio creep. And the very last point uh, of this uh, slide being the exchange between non inferiority and superiority in general is kind of discouraged. So in other words, you cannot run a, a superiority trial and you fail to, fail to show superiority you go back to non inferiority. That's very difficult. So there are different uh, uh, regulatory agency guidance talking about this. All right, but anyhow, let's look at this example of raloxifen versus tamoxifen. All right, primary endpoint invasive um, um, breast cancer. So raloxifen is test agent, tamoxifen is active control. All right, this is an uh, interesting setting here. All right, now if you look at Tamoxifen versus placebo. We typically use the uh, relative risk as a uh, drug versus control, right? Test drug versus control. But this here, the relevance is using placebo over test drug. So it's kind of a, uh, kind of in a in a different setting, all right? So if you look at tamoxifen versus placebo, where, where you're looking at the prior trial, all right? So the trial where tamoxifen was able to establish their efficacy, they got a relative risk of 2.12. In other words, for placebo risk over tamoxifen risk is 2.12. With a confidence interval of 1.52 to 3.03. So the interpretation is that placebo increases the rate of invasive breast cancer incidence compared to tamoxifen. What they say about 112%, that's 2.12 minus one, that's 112%. It was confidence interval 152% to 303%. So clearly placebo is worse, right? Relative risk for invasive uh, breast cancer, placebo over tamoxifen, all right? So that's kind of a, a strange setting, all right? But anyhow, given these are the data, how do we come up with this non-inferior margin for raloxifen, where you're comparing raloxifen against tamoxifen? All right, now the non-inferior margin, if you want to preserve 50% of active control uh, effect, um, if you want to retain that, then remember that's 112%, what? 112%, that's 2.12 minus one, that's 112%. So divided by two, you've got 56% increase in risk. So now they're looking at uh, the, uh, so from, again, placebo over the tamoxifen data, you want to have the relative risk of 1.56, okay? And that's one way of looking at it. 
Thus, upper bound of 95% confidence interval uh, estimate of the relative risk should be less than 1.56. If you look at this way, right, you're looking at preserving 50%. So that's one way of setting it. M is set equal to the lower bound of 95% confidence interval for the effect of C relative to P in the placebo control trial. So that was the uh, the uh, tamoxifen versus placebo trial, all right? Now in the non-inferiority trial, the new trial, the upper confidence limit for the effect of T relative to C has to be less than that value, all right? So now this is different. This is the test drug over control. Now test drug over control has to be less than 1.56, all right? So this criterion is stringent and depends directly on the strengths of the evidence. So the way you want to look at it is that in your, in your active control trial, your, your um, active control mean is lower than your placebo mean. Your active control mean is lower than your placebo mean. So lower is better. And this L is the lower confidence limit when you compare active control versus placebo, all right? So active control minus placebo is a negative value, right? The negative value would have a two-sided confidence interval, but you look at only one side and this is the lower, lower confidence limit. And you look at this distance being the half interval width of the active control minus placebo difference. So you set this point here, and you're choosing a margin in, be, in between the active control and lower limit. So for this margin, when you're test drug, comparing against active control, because lower is better, all right, lower is better. When you're test drug compared to uh, uh, active control, you want the upper limit to be lower than M. So this was the basic thinking of how to set the margin. So uh, I thought I could uh, finish the slides was, um, was in one hour, but uh, I couldn't, but I want to probably just stop here to give you some flavor of what non-infinity trial is about. Uh, so there are the issues uh, that I didn't have time to talk about. Um, uh, file creep, uh, so I mentioned what file creep is about. Uh, is uh, active control one is non-infinity to uh, Placebo active control two is not in favor of active control one. Active control three is not in favor of active control two. Then eventually is creeping to a placebo effect. So that's bio creep. And the other thing I didn't talk about is this exchange between non inferiority and superiority. And that uh, you can refer to the FDA guidance and the EMA guidance. All right. Uh, thank you.